Great Expectations by Charles Dickens Volume 3, Chapter 1 It was fortunate for me that I had to take precautions to ensure, so far as I could, the safety of my dreaded visitor. For, this thought pressing on me when I awoke, held other thoughts in a confused concourse at a distance. The impossibility of keeping him concealed in the chambers was self-evident. It could not be done— and the attempt to do it would inevitably engender suspicion. True, I had no avenger in my service now, but I was looked after by an inflammatory old female, assisted by an animated rag-bag whom she called her niece, and to keep a room secret from them would be to invite curiosity and exaggeration. They both had weak eyes, which I had long attributed to their chronically looking in at keyholes, and they were always at hand when not wanted." Indeed, that was their only reliable quality besides larceny. Not to get up a mystery with these people, I resolved to announce in the morning that my uncle had unexpectedly come from the country. This course I decided on while I was yet groping about in the darkness for the means of getting a light. Not stumbling on the means after all, I was fain to go out to the adjacent lodge and get the watchman there to come with his lantern. Now, in groping my way down the black staircase, I fell over something— and that something was a man crouching in a corner. As the man made no answer when I asked him what he did there, but eluded my touch in silence, I ran to the lodge and urged the watchman to come quickly, telling him of the incident on the way back. The wind being as fierce as ever, we did not care to endanger the light and the lantern by rekindling the extinguished lamps on the staircase, but we examined the staircase from the bottom to the top and found no one there. It then occurred to me as possible that the man might have slipped into my rooms, so, lighting my candle at the watchman's and leaving him standing at the door, I examined them carefully, including the room in which my dreaded guest lay asleep. All was quiet, and assuredly no other man was in those chambers. It troubled me that there should have been a lurker on the stairs, on that night of all nights in the year— and I asked the watchman, on the chance of eliciting some hopeful explanation as I handed him a dram at the door, whether he had admitted at his gate any gentleman who had perceptibly been dining out. Yes, he said, at different times of the night, three. One lived in Fountain Court, and the other two lived in the lane, and he had seen them all go home. Again, the only other man who dwelt in the house of which my chambers formed a part had been in the country for some weeks, and he certainly had not returned in the night because we had seen his door with his seal on it as we came upstairs. "'The night being so bad, sir,' said the watchman as he gave me back my glass, "'uncommon few have come in at my gate. Besides them three gentlemen that I have named, I don't call to mind another since about eleven o'clock when a stranger asked for you.' "'My uncle,' I muttered. "'Yes.' "'You saw him, sir?' "'Yes. Oh, yes.' "'Likewise, the person with him.' "'Person with him?' I repeated. "'I judged the person to be with him,' returned the watchman. "'The person stopped when he stopped to make inquiry of me, "'and the person took this way when he took this way.' "'What sort of person?' "'The watchman had not particularly noticed. "'He should say a working person. "'To the best of his belief, he had a dust-coloured kind of clothes on under a dark coat.' The watchman made more light of the matter than I did, and naturally, not having my reason for attaching weight to it. When I had got rid of him, which I thought it did well to do without prolonging explanations, my mind was much troubled by these two circumstances taken together. Whereas they were easy of innocent solution apart, as, for instance, some diner out or diner at home, who had not gone near this watchman's gate, might have strayed to my staircase and dropped asleep there and my nameless visitor might have brought someone with him to show him the way. Still, joined, they had an ugly look to one as prone to distrust and fear as the changes of a few hours had made me. I lighted my fire, which burnt with a raw pale flare at the time of the morning, and fell into a doze before it. I seemed to have been dozing a whole night when the clocks struck six. As there was full an hour and a half between me and daylight, I dozed again. Now, waking up uneasily with prolix conversations about nothing in my ears. Now, making thunder of the wind in the chimney. At length, falling off into a profound sleep from which the daylight woke me with a start. 
All this time I had never been able to consider my own situation, nor could I do so yet. I had not the power to attend to it. I was greatly dejected and distressed, but in an incoherent wholesale sort of way. As to forming any plan for the future, I could as soon have formed an elephant. When I opened the shutters and looked out at the wet, wild morning, all of a leaden hue, when I walked from room to room, when I sat down again, shivering before the fire, waiting for my laundress to appear, I thought how miserable I was, but hardly knew why or how long I had been so, or on what day of the week I made the reflection, or even who I was that made it. At last the old woman and the niece came in, the latter with a head not easily distinguishable from her dusty broom, and testified surprise at sight of me and the fire, to whom I imparted how my uncle had come in the night and was then asleep, and how the breakfast preparations were to be modified accordingly. Then I washed and dressed while they knocked the furniture about and made it dust, and so in a sort of dream or sleep-waking I found myself sitting by the fire again, waiting for... him to come to breakfast. By and by his door opened and he came out. I could not bring myself to bear the sight of him, and I thought he had a worse look by daylight. I do not even know, said I, speaking low as he took his seat at the table, by what name to call you. I have given out that you are my uncle. That's it, dear boy. Call me uncle. You assumed some name, I suppose, on board ship? Yes, dear boy, I took the name Provis. Do you mean to keep that name? Why, yes, dear boy, it's as good as another, unless you'd like another. What is your real name? I asked him in a whisper. Magwitch, he answered in the same tone. Christened Abel. What were you brought up to be? A warmit, dear boy. He answered quite seriously, and used the word as if it denoted some profession. "'When you came into the temple last night,' said I, pausing to wonder whether that could really have been last night, which seemed so long ago. "'Yes, dear boy. When you came in at the gate and asked the watchman the way here, had you anyone with you?' "'With me? No, dear boy. But there was someone there.' I didn't take particular notice, he said dubiously, not knowing the ways of the place, but I think there was a person, too, come in along or me. Are you known in London? I hope not, said he, giving his neck a jerk with his forefinger that made me turn hot and sick. Were you known in London once? Not over and above, dear boy. I was in the provinces, mostly. Were you... "'Tried in London?' "'Which time?' said he, with a sharp look. "'The last time.' "'He nodded. First knowed Mr. Jaggers that way. "'Jaggers was for me.' "'It was on my lips to ask him what he was tried for, "'but he took up a knife, gave it a flourish, "'and with the words, "'And what I'd done as worked out and paid for, "'fell to at his breakfast.' He ate in a ravenous way that was very disagreeable, and all his actions were uncouth, noisy, and greedy. Some of his teeth had failed him since I saw him eat on the marshes, and as he turned his food in his mouth and turned his head sideways to bring his strongest fangs to bear upon it, he looked terribly like a hungry old dog. If I had begun with any appetite, he would have taken it away, and I should have sat much as I did." "'repelled from him by an insurmountable aversion "'and gloomily looking at the cloth. "'I'm a heavy grubber, dear boy,' he said, "'as a polite kind of apology "'when he had made an end of his meal. "'But I always was. "'If it had been in my constitution to be a lighter grubber, "'I might have got into lighter trouble. "'Similarly, I must have my smoke. "'When I was first hired out as shepherd "'to t'other side of the world,' It's my belief I should have turned into a molloncolly mad sheep myself if I hadn't had my smoke. As he said so, he got up from the table, and putting his hand into the breast of the peacoat he wore, brought out a short black pipe and a handful of loose tobacco of the kind that is called negro head. Having filled his pipe, he put the surplus tobacco back again, as if his pocket were a drawer. 
Then he took a live coal from the fire with the tongs and lighted his pipe at it, and then turned round on the hearth rug with his back to the fire and went through his favorite action of holding out both his hands for mine. And this, said he, dandling my hands up and down in his as he puffed at his pipe. And this is the gentleman what I made, the real genuine one. It does me good for to look at you, Pip. All I stipulate is to stand by and look at you, dear boy. I released my hands as soon as I could, and found that I was beginning slowly to settle down to the contemplation of my condition. What I was chained to, and how heavily, became intelligible to me, as I heard his hoarse voice and sat looking up at his furrowed bald head with its iron-gray hair at the sides. I mustn't see my gentleman a-footing it in the mire of the streets. There mustn't be no mud on his boots. My gentleman must have horses, Pip. Horses to ride and horses to drive, and horses for his servant to ride and drive as well. Shall colonists have their horses, and bloodens, if you please, good lord, and not my London gentleman? No, no. We'll show him another pair of shoes than that, Pip, won't us? He took out of his pocket a great thick pocket book, bursting with papers, and tossed it on the table. There's something worth spending in that there book, dear boy. It's yourn. All I've got ain't mine. It's yourn. Don't you be afeard on it. There's more where that come from. I've come to the old country for to see my gentleman spend his money like a gentleman. That'll be my pleasure. My pleasure'll be for to see him do it. And blast you all, he wound up looking round the room and snapping his fingers once with a loud snap. Blast you every one, from the judge in his wig to the colonist a stirring up the dust. I'll show a better gentleman than the whole kit on you put together. Stop, said I, almost in a frenzy of fear and dislike. I want to speak to you. I want to know what is to be done. I want to know how you are to be kept out of danger, how long you are going to stay, what projects you have. Looky here, Pip, said he, laying his hand on my arm in a suddenly altered and subdued manner. First of all, looky here. I forgot myself half a minute ago. What I said was low. That's what it was. Low. Looky here, Pip. Look over it. I ain't a-going to be low. First, I resumed, half groaning, what precautions can be taken against your being recognized and seized? No, dear boy, he said in the same tone as before. That don't go first. Lowness goes first. I ain't took so many year to make a gentleman, not without knowing what's due to him. Looky here, Pip. I was low. That's what I was. Low. Look over it, dear boy. Some sense of the grimly ludicrous moved me to a fretful laugh as I replied, I have looked over it. In heaven's name, don't harp upon it. Yes, but looky here, he persisted. Dear boy, I ain't come so fur to be low. Now go on, dear boy. You was a saying. How are you to be guarded from the danger you have incurred? Well, dear boy, the danger ain't so great. Without, I was informed again, the danger ain't so much to signify. There's Jaggers, and there's Wemmick, and there's you. Who else is there to inform? Is there no chance person who might identify you in the street? said I. Well, he returned, there ain't many. Nor yet I don't intend to advertise myself in the newspapers by the name of A.M. come back from Botany Bay. And years has rolled by. And who's to gain by it? Still, looky here, Pip. If the danger had been fifty times as great, I should have come to see you. Mind you, just the same. And how long do you remain? How long? said he, taking his black pipe from his mouth and dropping his jaw as he stared at me. I'm not a going back. I've come for good. Where are you to live? said I. What is to be done with you? Where will you be safe? Dear boy, he returned, 
There's disguising wigs can be bought for money, and there's hair powder and spectacles and black clothes, shorts and what not. Others has done it safe afore, and what others has done afore others can do again. As to the where and how of living, dear boy, give me your own opinions on it. You take it smoothly now, said I, but you were very serious last night when you swore it was death. And so I swear it is death said he, putting his pipe back in his mouth. And death by the rope, in the open street not far from this, and it's serious that you should fully understand it to be so. What then, when that's once done? Here I am. To go back now, it'd be as bad as to stand ground. Worse. Besides, Pip, I'm here, because I've meant it by you. Years and years. As to what I dare, I'm an old bird now, as has dared all manner of traps since first he was fledged, and I'm not afeard to perch upon a scarecrow. If there's death hid inside it, there is, and let him come out and I'll face him, and then I'll believe in him and not afore. And now let me have a look at my gentleman again. Once more he took me by both hands and surveyed me with an air of admiring proprietorship smoking with great complacency all the while. It appeared to me that I could do no better than secure him some quiet lodging hard by, of which he might take possession when Herbert returned, whom I expected in two or three days. That the secret must be confided to Herbert as a matter of unavoidable necessity, even if I could have put the immense relief I should derive from sharing it with him out of the question, was plain to me. But it was by no means so plain to Mr. Provis, I resolved to call him by that name, who reserved his consent to Herbert's participation until he should have seen him and formed a favorable judgment of his physiognomy. "'And even then, dear boy,' said he, pulling a greasy little clasped black testament out of his pocket, "'we'll have him on his oath.' To state that my terrible patron carried this little black book about the world solely to swear people on in cases of emergency— would be to state what I never quite established. But this I can say, that I never knew him put it to any other use. The book itself had the appearance of having been stolen from some court of justice, and perhaps his knowledge of its antecedents, combined with his own experience in that wise, gave him a reliance on its powers as a sort of legal spell or charm. On this first occasion of his producing it, I recalled how he had made me swear fidelity in the churchyard long ago and how he had described himself last night as always swearing to his resolutions in his solitude. As he was at present dressed in a seafaring slop suit, in which he looked as if he had some parrots and cigars to dispose of, I next discussed with him what dress he should wear. He cherished an extraordinary belief in the virtues of shorts as a disguise, and had in his own mind sketched a dress for himself that would have made him something between a dean and a dentist. It was with considerable difficulty that I won him over to the assumption of a dress more like a prosperous farmer's, and we arranged that he should cut his hair close and wear a little powder. Lastly, as he had not yet been seen by the laundress or her niece, he was to keep himself out of their view until his change of dress was made. It would seem a simple matter to decide on the precautions, but in my dazed, not to say distracted, state— it took so long that I did not get out to further them until two or three in the afternoon. He was to remain shut up in the chambers while I was gone, and was on no account to open the door. There being, to my knowledge, a respectable lodging-house in Essex Street, the back of which looked into the temple, and was almost within hail of my windows, I first of all repaired to that house, and was so fortunate to secure the second floor for my uncle, Mr. Povis. I then went from shop to shop, making such purchases as were necessary to the change in his appearance. This business transacted, I turned my face on my own account to Little Britain. Mr. Jaggers was at his desk, but, seeing me enter, got up immediately and stood before his fire. "'Now, Pip,' said he, "'be careful.' "'I will, sir,' I returned, for I had thought well of what I was going to say coming along. "'Don't commit yourself.' said Mr. Jaggers, and don't commit anyone. You understand? Anyone. Don't tell me anything. I don't want to know anything. I am not curious. 
Of course I saw that he knew the man was come. I merely want, Mr. Jaggers, said I, to assure myself that what I have been told is true. I have no hope of its being untrue, but at least I may verify it. Mr. Jaggers nodded. But did you say told or informed? He asked me with his head on one side and not looking at me, but looking in a listening way at the floor. Told would seem to imply verbal communication. You can't have verbal communication with a man in New South Wales, you know. I will say informed, Mr. Jaggers. Good. I have been informed by a person named Abel Magwitch that he is the benefactor so long unknown to me. That is the man, said Mr. Jaggers, in New South Wales. And only he, said I. And only he, said Mr. Jaggers. I am not so unreasonable, sir, as to think you at all responsible for my mistakes and wrong conclusions, but I always supposed it was Miss Havisham. As you say, Pip, returned Mr. Jaggers, turning his eyes upon me coolly and taking a bite at his forefinger. I am not at all responsible for that. And did it look so like it, sir? I pleaded with a downcast heart. Not a particle of evidence, Pip, said Mr. Jaggers, shaking his head and gathering up his skirts. Take nothing on its looks. Take everything on evidence. There's no better rule. I have no more to say, said I with a sigh after standing silent for a little while. I have verified my information and there's an end. And Magwitch, in New South Wales, having at last disclosed himself, said Mr. Jaggers, you will comprehend, Pip, how rigidly throughout my communication with you I have always adhered to the strict line of fact. There has never been the least departure from the strict line of fact. You are quite aware of that? Quite, sir. I communicated to Magwitch, in New South Wales, when he first wrote to me, from New South Wales, the caution that he must not expect me ever to deviate from the strict line of fact. I also communicated to him another caution. He appeared to me to have obscurely hinted in his letter at some distant idea he had of seeing you in England here. I cautioned him that I must hear no more of that, that he was not at all likely to obtain a pardon, that he was expatriated for the term of his natural life, and that his presenting himself in this country would be an act of felony, rendering him liable to the extreme penalty of the law. I gave Magwitch that caution, said Mr. Jaggers, looking hard at me. I wrote it to New South Wales. He guided himself by it, no doubt. No doubt, said I. I have been informed by Wemmick, pursued Mr. Jaggers, still looking hard at me, that he has received a letter under date Portsmouth from a colonist of the name of Purvis, or... Or Provis, I suggested. Or Provis, thank you, Pip. Perhaps it is Provis. Perhaps you know it's Provis. Yes, said I. You know it's Provis. A letter, under date Portsmouth, from a colonist of the name of Provis, asking for the particulars of your address on behalf of Magwitch. Wemmick sent him the particulars, I understand, by return of post, Probably it is through Provis that you have received the explanation of Magwitch in New South Wales. It came through Provis, I replied. Good day, Pip, said Mr. Jaggers, offering his hand. Glad to have seen you. In writing by post to Magwitch in New South Wales, or in communicating with him through Provis, have the goodness to mention that the particulars and vouchers of our long account shall be sent to you, together with the balance, for there is still a balance remaining. Good day, Pip. We shook hands, and he looked hard at me as long as he could see me. I turned at the door, and he was still looking hard at me.
while the two vile casts on the shelf seemed to be trying to get their eyelids open and to force out of their swollen throats. Oh, what a man he is! Wemmick was out, and though he had been at his desk, he could have done nothing for me. I went straight back to the temple, where I found the terrible Provis drinking rum and water and smoking negro head in safety. Next day the clothes I had ordered all came home, and he put them on. Whatever he put on became him less, it dismally seemed to me, than what he had worn before. To my thinking there was something in him that made it hopeless to attempt to disguise him. The more I dressed him and the better I dressed him, the more he looked like the slouching fugitive on the marshes. This effect on my anxious fancy was partly referable, no doubt, to his old face and manner growing more familiar to me. But I believe, too, that he dragged one of his legs as if there were still a weight of iron on it, and that from head to foot there was convict in the very grain of the man. The influences of his solitary hut life were upon him besides, and gave him a savage air that no dress could tame. Added to these were the influences of his subsequent branded life among men, and crowning all, his consciousness that he was dodging and hiding now. In all his ways of sitting and standing and eating and drinking, of brooding about in a high-shouldered, reluctant style, of taking out his great horn-handled jackknife and wiping it on his legs and cutting his food, of lifting light glasses and cups to his lips as if they were clumsy pannikins, of chopping a wedge off his bread and soaking up with it the last fragments of gravy round and round his plate, as if to make the most of an allowance, and then drying his fingers' ends on it, and then swallowing it. In these ways, and a thousand other small nameless instances arising every minute in the day, there was prisoner, felon, bondsman, plain as plain could be. It had been his own idea to wear that touch of powder, and I had conceded the powder after overcoming the shorts. But I can compare the effect of it, when on, to nothing but the probable effect of rouge upon the dead. So awful was the manner in which everything in him that it was most desirable to repress started through that thin layer of pretense, and seemed to come blazing out at the crown of his head. It was abandoned as soon as tried, and he wore his grizzled hair cut short. Words cannot tell what a sense I had at the same time of the dreadful mystery that he was to me. When he fell asleep of an evening, with his knotted hands clenching the sides of the easy chair, and his bald head tattooed with deep wrinkles falling forward on his breast, I would sit and look at him, wondering what he had done, and loading him with all the crimes in the calendar— until the impulse was powerful on me to start up and fly from him. Every hour or so increased my abhorrence of him, that I even think I might have yielded to this impulse in the first agonies of being so haunted, notwithstanding all he had done for me, and the risk he ran, but for the knowledge that Herbert must soon come back. Once I actually did start out of bed in the night, and begin to dress myself in my worst clothes— hurriedly intending to leave him there with everything else I possessed, and enlist for India as a private soldier. I doubted if a ghost could have been more terrible to me, up in those lonely rooms in the long evenings and long nights, with the wind and the rain always rushing by. A ghost could not have been taken and hanged on my account, and the consideration that he could be, and the dread that he would be, were no small addition to my horrors. When he was not asleep, or playing a complicated kind of patience with a ragged pack of cards of his own, a game that I never saw before or since, and in which he recorded his winnings by sticking his jackknife into the table, when he was not engaged in either of these pursuits, he would ask me to read to him. Foreign language, dear boy. While I complied, he, not comprehending a single word, would stand before the fire surveying me with the air of an exhibitor, and I would see him, between the fingers of the hand with which I shaded my face, appealing in dumb show to the furniture to take notice of my proficiency. The imaginary student pursued by the misshapen creature he had impiously made was not more wretched than I, pursued by the creature who had made me and recoiling from him with a stronger repulsion, the more he admired me and the fonder he was of me. 
This is written of, I am sensible, as if it had lasted a year. It lasted about five days. Expecting Herbert all the time, I dared not go out, except when I took Provis for an airing after dark. At length, one evening, when dinner was over and I had dropped into a slumber quite worn out, for my nights had been agitated and my rest broken by fearful dreams, I was roused by the welcome footstep on the staircase. Provis, who had been asleep too, staggered up at the noise I made, and in an instant I saw his jackknife shining in his hand. Quiet! It's Herbert, I said, and Herbert came bursting in with the airy freshness of six hundred miles of France upon him. Handel, my dear fellow, how are you? And again, how are you? And again, how are you? I seem to have been gone a twelve-month. Why, so I must have been, for you have grown quite thin and pale. Handel, my... Hello, eh? I beg your pardon. He was stopped in his running on and in his shaking hands with me by seeing Provis. Provis, regarding him with a fixed attention, was slowly putting up his jackknife and groping in another pocket for something else. Herbert, my dear friend, said I, shutting the double doors while Herbert stood staring and wondering. Something very strange has happened. This is a visitor of mine. It's all right, dear boy, said Provis, coming forward with his little clasped black book and then addressing himself to Herbert. Take it in your right hand. Lord, strike you dead on the spot if ever you split in any way some other. Kiss it. Do so as he wishes it, I said to Herbert. So Herbert, looking at me with a friendly uneasiness and amazement, complied, and Provis, immediately shaking hands with him, said, Now you're on your oath, you know, and never believe me on mine if Pip shan't make a gentleman on you.